our heart is collectively breaking. When one of us is hurting in the body of Christ, we, we all hurt. The events that took place at the Capitol on Wednesday were saddening and heartbreaking. As the church, we must do all we can to pray for our leaders, to pray for God's intercession in our country, and to pray for one another. That we would respond with love, not more hatred. That we would respond with kindness, not more rhetoric. That we would respond with compassion, not adding fuel to the hurt that has been happening uh, throughout the church. Church, let's be unifiers and peacemakers as we are called to be. Let's remember our first love and let's remember that we are one, united under Christ. Our heart for the church and this country has been that, that we would be one. We're reminded of the high priestly prayer of Jesus in John 17. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you have loved me. Friends, let's pray with one voice and one heart for those that are in leadership to be wise and understanding. Let's pray for healing for our country, that, that we would stop looking at what divides us in, in order to, to find the things that unite us. And let's pray for one another that we would choose and embrace love. Friends, let's be the church.
Think about a time that you stubbed your toe. It was probably in the middle of the night, getting up to get a drink of water or go to the bathroom. You probably caught the corner of the bed in some way. When you stub your toe, it's not just the toe that's affected, right? Your, your whole body gets involved in the process, all right? You, you feel it in, in your legs as they tense up. You feel it in your stomach as it begins to contract and you bend over. Your hands respond to grab the affected area. And, and then suddenly your, your head begins to bend down and, and your eyes strain as you, as you try and see what's happened to your, your toe. In a similar way, when there's discord in the church, it affects the entire community. Right? When, there, when there's something happening in someone's life, it's not just one person that's affected. It affects the entire community at large. It's not just one person who's hurting. It's everybody hurting together. See, God desires for us to be one. He desires unity amongst all of the believers. Discord hurts our unity. It creates division in our hearts and it creates division in the church. And this is what Paul is getting after when he's addressing the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 12, 24 through 26. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Verse 25 compels us to provide care for one another, that we would be unified in our ability to, to care about what's happening in our world, that we would, we would share in our trials and we would also share in our victories. You see, we're not just a group of individuals who happen to gather in a room in, in order to, to declare our allegiance for God. We are one church, one body, who gathers together to care about and to care for each other. We are dependent on one another. We show our unity by the way in which we, we care for each other, showing hospitality, praying for each other, encouraging each other with God's word. Worship reminds us of the unity that we have with God, and it reminds us of the unity that we have with each other. As we prepare our hearts for worship, Let's be mindful of our unity with God and each other as we praise God with one voice. Let's worship together.
about making some big changes or setting some ambitious goals for yourself. Maybe you want to lose 20 pounds or read through the Bible. 
Maybe you want to run a marathon or repair a broken relationship. Whatever your big goal is, the temptation is to expect to go straight from here to here, or from here to here. The reality is, there are a lot of small steps between big decisions and big results. Challenges and obstacles await. At some point, you might even want to quit. But stand firm. Don't be disappointed with slow progress. Don't be overwhelmed by the destination. Rather, focus on what you can do today. Skip dessert. Read a chapter. Go for a run. Make a phone call. The more difficult the journey, the more rewarding the destination. And it can all start today with just one small step. If you're born before 1986, then I'm sure you remember uh, the explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger. In 1986, a crew of astronauts, as well as a civilian teacher, were poised to take a historic flight on the Space Shuttle Challenger. The event was being broadcast to classrooms all across the country. The historic flight lasted only 73 seconds. The external fuel tank collapsed due to a leak in the shuttle's uh, right solid rocket booster joint, which released liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen propellants at the same time. This dangerous combination ignited, creating a giant fireball. Now, I remember being in typing class in high school and, and hearing the, the principal come over the loudspeaker as they announced the tragedy of this event. Years later, after examining all of the details and evidence, it was determined that this entire catastrophe could have been avoided by one simple phone call. One call could have saved the lives of everyone on board and prevented this disaster from ever taking place. But no one made that phone call. Jesse Moore or Gene Thomas could have made the call to cancel the flight, but they didn't have the necessary information to make that call. At the engineers from the Tyokal factory in Utah, the builders of the solid rocket boosters, told their bosses that the ta Challenger should abort the launch because of the colder overnight weather temps that were taking place. The critical information was clogged up by top managers and others who felt like they knew better, uh, and, and they believed they were making the right decision. Cold is the enemy of elasticity. Elasticity of the, of the thin O-rings is what allows the segments of the massive solid rockets motors to seal in the thousand degree gases that build up uh, as they're being ignited. With, with the cold snap the night before, the seals failed at ignition. Uh, a channel was created through the two inch seal uh, in the motor casing joint and, and that would typically seal in the molten metal. 73 seconds into the flight, a stream of fire erupted from the rear joint and burned through the strut, holding the solid motor in place. It pivoted outward, and the top of the motor crushed the hydrogen and oxygen tanks at the top of the external tank, releasing their contents to ignite into an explosive inferno. This problem was known about and was being addressed in another program, but there was no protocol in place to keep this launch from happening. One phone call could have changed everything. It's easy to look back and say, this is what should have happened or could have happened, right? Hindsight is always 2020. And you've probably done this to yourself as you've replayed past decisions and mistakes in your mind as you, just as your head is setting the pillow and you, you play the events of your past over and over. If you'd just done one thing or if you just stopped doing that one thing, that through God's word, we're able to see which things in this life lead to a heartache and which things in this life lead to triumph. You see, Scripture leads the believer through life's one thing to help us avoid unnecessary hurt and experience greater contentment. If you're a note taker, it's a good time to open up your app and, and follow along in the Roots page. But Scripture leads the believer through life's one thing to help us avoid unnecessary hurt and to experience greater contentment. You see, God's not up in he heaven hoping that we just get it right 
He's not a mean heavenly father that derives some kind of weird and sick joy watching us struggle through this life. God has given us his word to help us make good choices. He's given us living examples throughout scripture of people who've made good decisions as well as those who've chosen poorly. One such example is the story of the rich young man. As we'll learn, one thing stood in the way of him following God more closely. Let's pray as we discover what that one thing is. Almighty God, we thank you that you have not been silent about how to live this life well. Lord, that you, you've given us your word to instruct us and guide us. Lord, as we open your word now, may you open our hearts, Lord, to the things in our life that we can do uh, in order to follow you more closely. We thank you for this time together, Lord. It's in your son's name that we pray these things. Amen. Well, we're in this series called One Thing. And Dan did a great job last week of leading us through Psalm 27. As we looked at the heart of David and the one thing he desired, which was to be in the house of the Lord. Now, life is filled with so many decisions, big ones, little ones. And these decisions get compounded when we believe that we've chosen poorly in the past. We, we almost uh, get stagnant in making good choices. But fortunately, we serve a loving God who, who's given us clear instruction in how to be successful in this life. This doesn't mean that we will never experience pain. Uh, it doesn't mean that, that life will be scot-free all the time. But what it does mean is that we can avoid a lot of unnecessary hurt if we apply God's word to our life. Through God's word and the work of the Holy Spirit, God reveals the things we need to do in order to better follow him in our faith. And this series is meant to explore the one thing people needed to do in order to grow their faith. What would our faith be like if we focused less on the one thing from our past uh, that we wished we'd done and instead focused our attention on one thing we can do in order to grow our faith? As believers, we get bogged down by all the different things we need to do in order to grow our faith. In fact, we fail to get started sometimes because of all of the things we think we could be doing. We start to feel guilty because we think we should, we should pray more, read more, we should do more for God. Uh, the comparison game makes it worse as we, as we hear about the robust faith of others and we get discouraged by how little we're doing. The guilt floods in because we don't think we're doing enough. And inevitably, these kinds of feelings tend to draw us away from God because we don't like to feel guilty. We don't like to feel that we're disappointing God in some way. So rather than beginning something, we end up doing nothing. Instead of focusing on all the different things we need to do, what if we just started to focus on one thing? What if we decided to, to, to make a change in just one area of our life in, in order to grow closer to God? Your one thing could be reading, it could be serving, it could be joining a group, and maybe it's giving up on a sin or giving up on a grudge that you've been harboring for years. See, all of us have one thing that we can do in order to grow closer to God, to deepen our faith. You see, addressing our one thing moves the believer toward a more authentic faith in God. Because what we're doing is, is we're surrendering to God. We're submitting to God because he's given us his word to guide us and direct us. What would happen to your faith if you chose to address one thing in order to be more like Jesus? And speaking about trials, Peter said we should rejoice because it was proving the genuineness of our faith. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, it says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, trials, whether good or bad, have a, have a way of growing our faith. The one thing you take on can be the very event that moves you toward a deeper, more authentic relationship with God. Dr. Kenneth Woost uh, compares this text to a, a prospector 
bringing ore in to be tested. The assayer gives him a certificate stating that the ore contains gold. The certificate is the approval of the ore. Uh, and that piece of paper is suddenly worth more than this little sample of ore that was tested. And you see, in the same way, our faith is tested, a sample at a time. See, the trials we endure confirm our faith in the present. Instead of getting bogged down by indecision over the many things we could be doing, what if we chose to start by picking one thing that will help us draw closer to God. Failure to address our one thing leads us to a faith that's shallow because it means that that we're actively ignoring the things God is calling us to do, the things that can make us successful in our faith. In high school, I had a coach give me a a litany of things that I I could do in order to grow as an athlete. And he took time to help me develop personally based on areas he felt that I needed to improve. This was not a canned plan meant for everyone. This was a specific plan that he developed just for me. Now, unfortunately, as a know-it-all kid, I thought I I knew better. I had a lot of other responsibilities and things I wanted to do, so I justified not doing the things he was instructing me to do. It didn't take long for that coach to focus attention on someone else, somebody who would respond to the, the advice he was giving. You see, in our spirit, we know the things that we should be doing in order to draw closer to God. Even now, as I'm speaking these words, I know that something is stirring in your heart through the Holy Spirit. The question for all of us is, will we address that one thing? Will Will we actually follow through on what God is calling us to do? In Mark 10, we learn about the rich young man. And as you can probably assume from the title, uh, this person is rich, this person is young, and this person is a man. Uh, Before we jump into the text, I want to make something perfectly clear. This text is not an indictment on wealth. A lot of times we can can read into the text and we we can draw something out of it that wasn't meant to be there. And for some people, they read this text and there's a thought that maybe, maybe God hates money. And the truth is, this isn't about the man's wealth. This is all about lordship. You see, living a life of poverty is not the one thing Jesus is getting at in this exchange. Ultimately, it's about his heart. So let's turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 10. This story is told in three of the four gospel accounts. Mark's version is probably my favorite because in Mark's version, we we see Jesus' compassion toward this young man. He's not trying to trap him. He's not trying to trick him in any way. In fact, you can see that Jesus cares for him. He shows compassion and love for this young man. In fact, the text specifically says that Jesus loved him. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. And he was setting out on his journey. A man Uh, A man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept for my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And said to him, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful. For he had great possessions. The young man approaches Jesus with respect. Calling him, calling him good teacher and kneeling before Christ. Jesus is addressing what is truly king of this young man's heart. See, the young man lacked one thing, lordship, which hindered him from following God more closely. The question for all of us to wrestle is, what's hindering us? What's hindering you in following God more closely? Jesus gets the heart of what's really on the throne of this young man's life. See, lordship is a matter of surrender. In, the, in his Advent book, Come, Let Us Adore Him, Paul David Tripp 
It says, the baby in the manger came as a conquering king to dethrone us and then enthrone himself in our hearts and lives forever and ever. See, the young man had enthroned his money. His money represented security. It represented peace. It gave him a source of comfort. It was a source of power as he probably had people give him respect because of his position within society and within the community. The rich young man's money was likely a big source of his identity. And Jesus says to him, sell everything and come follow me. Jesus points the young man to the law of Moses. You see, the law is a mirror that shows our sin, but the mirror cannot wash us clean. Keeping the law will not save us from sin in our life, and it won't provide the grace that we need. That's where we need Christ in our life. But the purpose of the law is to bring uh, the sinner, us, to Jesus. The young man in the story broke the very first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. On his own, the young man was doing a good job of following God's law. But it took Jesus for him to see the parts of his life that were out of step with his faith. It took Jesus to point out that one thing that was holding him back from really experiencing a a deep relationship with Christ. Jesus was able to reveal the one thing the the young man lacked, and that was surrender. Grace without change is stagnation. Change through grace brings redemption. It's God using the, the mistakes of our past to put us on another path that leads us closer to him, that provides freedom from sin, that, that gives us victory in our life. God gives us grace through Christ. And in light of that grace, the believer is invited to deepen their faith by continuing to trust. The rich young man trusted his money more than Christ. Jesus wanted to use that one thing to bring the young man into a deeper faith. The change through grace brings redemption. What are you trusting more than Jesus? What one thing is standing in the way of you trusting Jesus more and developing a deeper faith? Your next move is to prayerfully consider what you should start or stop doing in order to live a more robust life of faith. Consider asking a friend or or your pastor for some insight on what that one thing might be. Friends, let's not get bogged down in our faith. Let's not get bogged down by the many different things we could be doing. And instead, let's let's follow one thing that that is being stirred up by the Holy Spirit to start doing in order to draw closer to God and deepen our faith. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the opportunity to be challenged by your word. And Father, even now, as as you're putting a finger on that one thing, each of us maybe should start doing or stop doing in our life. Lord, may we have the courage to step out in faith, Lord, to trust you more than the things of this world. Lord, we we thank you for the gift of your word. And we thank you, Lord, that you've not been quiet on how how to live this life well. We give you praise and glory for our time together. It's in your son's name that we pray these things. Amen. Well, my benediction for you comes out of Jude. May you build yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. I want to thank you for joining us online. If you came ready with your gifts and offering, I want to remind you that we still have our joy box. You can give online or you can always mail a check into the church. Have a wonderful week. God bless you, and and may God be with you as you chase after that one thing. 2020 has been a crazy year for all of us. There's no doubt that all of you are feeling extra stress, taking on new roles. Anxiety and depression has been higher than ever. And because of that, that's put so much pressure on people's mental health. Suicidal thoughts, suicidal actions, and rates have gone up. So as a community, we want to be part of the solution. We want to be equipped to be first responders. 
So to do that, we need to know the signs. We need to know how to equip people to recognize what to do and how to direct people to get the help they need. On Tuesday, January 19th at 6.30, we're hosting a QPR training event that will give you the tools you need to prevent suicide. This training will help us all be better at recognizing what we do in response to suicidal signs and how to help our loved ones get the help they need. You can sign up for this event by texting QPR to 855-734-3900. This event is limited to 50 people, and we are going to practice all of the social distancing protocols. So this training is for everyone. Imagine if all of us knew what to look for and how to help when it comes to suicidal thoughts and actions. Our community can make such a difference. How many of us have ever been stumped by a spiritual question? For instance, maybe someone's asked us, well, why is it a good thing to attend church? Or why would I put my trust in the Bible? Now, it's not a bad thing if you don't necessarily feel like you can answer these questions, but I do think it might indicate that you have an opportunity for growth this year. This winter, we want to offer a class that will help you understand some of the basics of our faith. Like, what do Christians believe about the Bible? Like, how exactly does Jesus save me? What am I supposed to do after I believe? And what, what is the benefit of going to church? We are calling this class a bit more than basic. Right, for those who are young in your faith, this is a great first step. I promise you won't feel overwhelmed. And for those who are maybe more experienced in your faith, this might be a great next step for you. And I promise again that it will leave you with greater clarity and confidence about how to understand your faith. In 2021, let's invest ourselves to grow in our understanding and love for God. If you are interested, you can sign up on our website. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions.